Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Dean Sarinilio. Uh, on behalf of the Asian Pacific American Institute, uh, it's my honor to welcome you to tonight's screening of Mele Murals. Um, tonight's screening is a joint effort by Na'uivi, New York City, Halavai, uh, the Asian Pacific American Institute, uh, and the generous support of Columbia University's Pacific Climate Circuits Working Group. And so at this time, I'd actually just like to invite uh, our friend Kevin Feles, who is an assistant professor of music and African American Studies at Columbia University and one of the conveners of uh, Columbia University Pacific Climate Circuits Working Group uh, to say a few words. Uh, good evening. Um, it's really just an honor for me to be part of this event here this evening. Um, and I'm so happy that uh, Dean and the people at the APA Institute here at NYU reached out to us uh, to co-sponsor. Um, this event. Uh, it's a wonderful film that you're about to see. Uh, and I just wanted to say briefly about the Pacific Climate um, group that I'm a working group that I'm a part of. It's so far it's been fairly sort of small private affair. We hope to expand and be a little bit more public next year. It's a three year sort of working group. Um, that actually it wasn't my idea actually. It was Paige West and JC Sawyer who are anthropologists at Barnard. Um, and the three of us got together to think about global climate change and to not sort of focus on the bad news of global climate change, but to think about solutions and to think about the ways in which, um, and particularly to sort of recalibrate the, the focus on Western scientific um, notions of, you know, of solutions and to sort of bring to bear indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous ways of already sort of um, being in place and having solutions themselves, right? Um, and so we've been inviting activists, scholars to, to come and talk with us about some of those solutions that, you know, um, for us, they're solutions that unlike some of the solutions that might come out of Western science are su sustainable, right? sort of rethink the relationship between the human and non-human, right? Um, to even sort of, uh, sort of problematize that relationship and to be cognizant of that sort of re reciprocal nature of that relationship. Um, so that's briefly what my working group's interest in all of this is. And um, we look forward to actually having maybe a public event of ourselves next year at some point and inviting all of you to join with us. Um, in any case, I won't take up too much more of your time and sort of um, want to thank again Dean and the people here at the APA for inviting us to be a part of this. Thank you. So I'm going to keep my comments very brief so that I can get out of the way and we can watch the film. Um, so uh, we're excited to have the director of the film, uh, Tad Nakamura. Um, Tad Nakamura, uh, who just came to us from Ithaca, is on a whirlwind tour screening the film. Uh, our friends over at Cornell said they loved uh, the film last night and the conversation. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have Nolani Gudyaka Opua, uh, who is a, a professor of indigenous politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and just arrived this afternoon uh, from Hawaii. And so this film truly speaks for itself. It's uh, uh, one of the, personally speaking, I, I feel like it's one of the best films about Hawaii right now. Um, and it gives us uh, so many kinds of urgent possibilities um, and hope, uh, which is, I think, direly needed in this critical moment uh, we are in. So I'll get out of the way, um, and I look forward to a conversation and Q&A after the film. Thank you so much for being with us. So we're very fortunate to have uh, the director of the film, Tad Nakamura, but also Noolani Goodyear uh, Kaupua. And I, I know you have a more fuller bio uh, in your program, uh, but I just wanted to um, say like a, a few things. So Tad is an award-winning filmmaker uh, who himself also comes from a family of filmmakers. Your mom and dad are both filmmakers. And so you guys are just masterful storytellers. Yeah. And so, um, but all of you use your films for social justice purposes. Um, I think I've used all of your films in my classes, yeah, actually. And um, for uh, students, staff, faculty, um, all of his films are, are at Avery Fisher um, in the Bulbs Library. Uh, Noelani Noela Gudia Kaupua um, is a well-known scholar and organizer uh, in the movement to deoccupy Hawaii from the United States. Um, 
But Noe is also the co-founder of Halau Kumana, which is a Hawaiian charter school very similar to the, to the school that you saw in this film. Um, her work is at the cutting edge of indigenous resurgence, materially creating alternatives to a settler colonial system. Um, I just taught her book, uh, The Seeds We Planted, uh, in uh, a class this past week. And so there are students actually in the crowd who have just read your work. Um, but for those uh, who haven't read her work, I, I highly recommend re highly recommend her work. And so um, I just, we're going to ask like a, a few general questions, and then we'll just open up to the audience. Um, and so like the first question is for you, Tad. And, and um, throughout the film, you, you really see the kind of individual uh, growth of the artists, and um, that kind of individual growth and sort of like self-challenging is also for a kind of larger good that's more collective, right? Um, and at the same time, um, we're witnessing your artistry, but we're not actually getting a chance to hear from you about what um, the process of producing the film, making the film was like for you as an artist as well. And so I guess I just wanted to hear from you what the process of making the film was like for you, visiting these specific places, meeting these specific people. Yeah, I mean, this was this is a huge, just, and, and continues to be a huge learning experience for me. Um, you know, this is, uh, my fifth film, but the first film that I've done outside of my own Japanese American community, um, and and that was very on purpose in terms of um, you know I'm come from the um, UCLA ethnocommunications program, and we really feel that um, you know stories should really be told from within the community and not from without, and so I felt that it, it was never my place to tell a story uh, outside of my own community. Uh, so when uh, so, uh, OUV TV, um, again, I, I feel kind of always weird representing the film by myself, uh, so I feel it, it was such a collective effort that I feel that I'm here to both represent uh, myself, but as well as Keone Lee, the producer, uh, Justin Achang, the cinematographer, and Aina Paikai, uh, the associate producer, because it was really uh, the f uh, kind of team of four, and it was a, on all levels was a very uh, totally collective effort. Um, but, you know, so I'd worked with OUV TV, on my last film on Jake Shimabukuro. And um, you know that, that was when, for, on that project, OEV TV was helping me tell a story about a Japanese American artist in Hawaii. Uh, and now, and so for this one, it was kind of to flip that. And really for me to support them in telling a story about two Hawaiian artists in Hawaii. Uh, so it was, um, you know, I, I, I still don't know if I was the right person to, to direct the film or not, um, but it was, it was really important for me to understand what my role was from them to ask, you know, OEV TV what they wanted me to do, um, and really w was to make sure to come in knowing I'm a guest, um, knowing I'm I am an outsider and a visitor, and to stay in that lane, you know, and, and to really um, not overstep that, um, and you know, working with with OEV TV, working with Prime and Estria, um, you know, we all got along so well that. Uh, and, and they were really good with keeping me in my place, which is good. Um, so it, it was it was it was a, a learning experience, not only you know, from from just basic vocabulary words. Aina gave me flashcards, right? <laughs> of like you know, kuleana, right? You know, you know, basic concepts that I really needed to understand in order to even uh, do the interviews or cut the interviews. And so the, fr from that all the way to you know, witnessing the deep um, connection, you know. For, to the land, uh, but also too the, the deep connection of just community in Waimea, um, and I think that was um, that was something that you know I, I take take care with me still today, uh, and you know I, and just really was coming back was really being able to to get a better understanding of a indigenous worldview, uh, and that you know I think that. Um, is continuing uh, even as we s continue to screen the films, as I interact with different audiences. So it's it's just been a, a great learning experience. So uh, Noe, I was um, hoping you might be able to um, help us to situate uh, this film or this school within the the larger sort of um, landscape of education in Hawaii. Um, and you, you write so beautifully in your book, The Seeds We Planted, about um, the challenges of using an indigenous curriculum. Um, especially in a, in a place where indigenous knowledge is oftentimes devalued. Um, and I mean, this film really helps us to think about alternative ways of, of knowing and being and learning, et cetera. And um, it, it resonates so much with what I learned from your work. 
So how do we situate um, this school as, as and what is, is, was it, how is it unique or, or different from like a general public education system in Hawaii? Thank you for that question, and thank you so much for the work, Todd. It's just really beautiful. Um, and I also want to just acknowledge the poe oibi and the aumaku and the aku of this place, because um, that's one of the things that the film, I think, reminds us of so beautifully is the presence of indigenous people and um, and our ancestors and, and deities. So thank you for that. <coughs> um, <coughs> Kanoa Kaina is the mother charter school in many ways of the Hawaiian charter schools. Um, the charter school movement in Hawaii is pretty unique uh, when compared with other parts of <coughs> or other states within the United States. Um, there's a, a limited number of schools in Hawaii and, and half of them are um, started by Native Hawaiian community organizations. So unlike in states where there are for-profit organizations that start charter schools. Um, the charter school movement that really began um, right at the beginning of 2000, <coughs> um, <coughs> largely in part because of um, Kanu, uh, Kanu's founders, Ku and Ale Kahakalao, who went from island to island talking to Hawaiian communities and saying, look, there's going to be this opportunity to start schools, and this is our one chance <laughs> that we have to really kind of, you know, begin to change or plant seeds for change in the public school education system. So another thing that's unique about the um, public school education system in Hawaii is that <coughs> Native Hawaiians make up the largest ethnic group in the, um, in the system, even though we're about 20% of the population. So <coughs> there's no other states that I know of where <coughs> indigenous people are the largest group within the public system. Um, and yet, uh, Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian history is relegated to a very, very small place within the curriculum, and that was only because of movements that ha took place in the um, 1970s. Sorry. Um, and I think one thing that I wanted to say was that you, you really can't talk about Hawaiian charter schools without talking about the larger Hawaiian movement for land and sovereignty. Um, and this film, I think, makes such beautiful connections between hip hop culture and Hawaiian culture and um, Prime historicizes that a little bit, but you could really go back um, even further to look at the ways that um, our movements and cultures have, have intersected and, and informed each other in different ways. So um, it's really not a surprise in a lot of ways that, um, you know, someone like Prime who was growing up um, in urban Honolulu, uh, would find resonance in hip hop culture because, um, you know, if you look at when the large public housing developments were built in Honolulu, um, the, the span of when they started to be built and um, kind of parallels with when, mm -hmm. as far as I un am understanding it, when the Cross Bronx Expressway was built and some of the um, development that was happening in New York that was changing. Um, the South Bronx that led to hip hop culture where a lot of similar kinds of um, development was happening to enrich some and impoverish others in Hawaii. Um, so in Hawaii that manifested in eviction struggles, in struggles for water, and many of those struggles directly led to another generation, sort of my generation, that then started these charter schools. So it was um, a direct outgrowth of Hawaiian social movement that preceded us that was informed by um, not only hip hop culture, but the generation of activists that came before me were also very much directly um, influenced by uh, the black power and black freedom movements. We have activist um, Moni Akaka, who just recently passed away, um, was one of the Hawaiian activists in the 1970s who came and visited um, Black Panther Party and Young Lords. Um, we had, I was just um, talking not long ago with um, one of my mentors, Teriki Ko'olani, talking about how um, Eldridge Cleaver's book, Soul on Ice, was sort of a turning point moment for her when she read that in high school. Um, so there's a lot of these really neat resonances that, you know, I think this film just kind of shows a, a new generation's iteration of those resonances. Noe, Tad, Ekumumai, welcome to New York City. I hope you guys enjoyed the flight, but um, specifically to Noe, I'm going to ask, 
I'm sure that it was kind of touched upon in the movie about culturally being correct, especially with like um, the faces and a lot of the portraits. I'm sure there's parts of the Hawaiian community that are opposed to tag and the culture being shown in this way. How is that like balanced between um, between the movement that's trying to use it in a culture appropriate way and teaching stories and the people who are very like strict and staying with hula and other forms that are well known? Um, I don't know if you probably could answer this question just as much as I could. Um, I haven't actually heard much opposition to the work that, um, you know, I'm much more familiar with Prime than Estria and the work that 808 Urban has done. Um, but all of the folks that I know are really excited about it. Auntie Pua Case, who's featured in the film, is a very um, well-known kumuhula. Um, the Bertelman Ohana is very prominent in the Va'a movement. Um, so these are people that are seen as having a tremendous amount of cultural integrity from a sort of traditional perspective. Um, and I don't know, did you guys hear of any sort of criticisms or opposition? I, I mean, I, I could only speak to this project specifically with Kanu, and I think um, it was really, I think uh, the teacher, uh, Kanoa Castro, was really, um, he was kind of that in-between that um, he kind of did have to do a little bit of convincing uh, with some of the elders in the community, but because because the elders trusted Kanoa, they they trusted or they you know they gave it a shot. Um, so I really think you know it was really impressive. I was really impressed by just the how much impact one educator can have, and and I think what Kanoa really brings is that he has well he has one foot um, you know in in Kanu and in Waimea. He also has another foot in just he's just a hip hop fan, right? And um, and so he's able to kind of bring a lot of things that maybe some other teachers wouldn't bring into into the classroom. But it, if it wasn't for Kanoa to kind of really um, have the vision of, of bringing them to the school, but also to having, you know, just doing the groundwork, um, you know, I think he had he basically presented every month, you know, kind of had to explain. So it was a long process to, to get everyone on board. Uh, but I think really if it wasn't for Kanoa, uh, I don't think the, the community would have ha had such trust in the beginning. There was a hand here. Yeah, um, actually two questions. Uh, was this uh, film shown uh, just recently? Uh, I mean, did it premiere? Uh, and was it uh, shown in uh, San Francisco's uh, CAM Festival? Because I see that uh, CAM had uh, sponsored this. And, and the second question is, where is the mural exactly? Because uh, um, it talks about the charter school, and I think you're led to uh, believe that it's, it's painted on the charter school, but I think, you know, visually, it's not there. It's somewhere else. Yeah, um, to answer your first question, we, um, we technically had our world premiere at the CAM Fest in Oakland and San Francisco last year. Um, but then this is also just for all filmmakers out there. Um, you know, premiere status is very important, um, but what we did is that we still felt that the first people that should see the film would be the Waimea community. So we, all you have to do is have an invite-only, non-public screening, and then that doesn't break your, your premiere status, just if you guys need to know that later. <laughs> um, so, so, so we did have the first, the very first public screening was in Waimea. Um, and yeah, you're correct, the, the mural is actually painted on the Kalihu Theater, so it's the main theater in the community. And so the cool part, it was the mural was, you know, all that took place on the outside of the theater, and then we screened it inside the theater. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really cool for, and you know, all the students came and all their, you know, and it was, it was funny because, it, you know, we took about three years to make the film. So, you know, a lot of, some of the little kids were a little bit older, and, um, but it was, it was really, really cool. And it was, um, I think it was, it was very interesting to see how they reacted to seeing, you know, because a lot of the students kept on saying like, wow, this is, this is like a real movie, you know, like, <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, like can always explain like, you know, to them, they thought it was going to be like a student project or maybe something super local, like a 10 minute thing. Uh, and then I think once um, the best part so far even, um, is that, you know, we've been screening it 
around the country. And so, for example, um, one of the students, Alyssa, she's going to college in Chicago now. She was a senior. Um, so I got to sit next to her when we screened it in Chicago. And then uh, Kayla, who was in, a student, is now going to college in Seattle. And it was, it's really fun to sit and watch the film with them in a, in a total other context. Because to them, even, they're like kind of like, do they understand? You know, they're kind of like, why are they laughing? Do they understand the jokes? Or, um, <laughs> But but I do I mean that's the reason why why I make chose to make films you know is is you know as people of color as marginalized communities we rarely see accurate portrayals of ourselves uh, and true reflections of ourselves on screen and and so when we do see that even if it's something as simple as you know seeing your neighborhood seeing your you know your school on 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 the screen it's I think it's very empowering so I think that was that was a, a big treat for me to be able to sit with some of the students in in another context and. Watch them watch the film. What's going on, Ted? What's up, What's up man? Um, I just, I mean, aside from, uh, I just got a, one simple question. Um, I mean, you did mention the uh, language barrier, but uh, aside from that, what were some of the difficulties that you faced uh, while working on this film? I, I mean, I think the, the biggest difficulty was, was kind of to... To, to be respectful um, and to, to kind of not overstep my bounds, but at the same time knowing that, kind of like, what, you know, what, what is my kuleana with this project, right? What is my responsibility? Um, and so on one hand, as a director, I'm responsible for getting certain shots. And, but at the same time, um, I'm, I was asked by a community to help them. So it was that. It was that. So for a good example is like, um, for the, the, the garage scene at the Burrowmans, right? Um, I think that's when, for me, as a, you know, as someone from LA, I was telling Ina, like, you know, bring your camera, just, just you know, he's like, nah, but you know, we're just gonna hang out, you know, like, I was just like, just bring it just in case, you know, and I, it was one of those things of like, um, just kind of pushing them to, to film, because I, I really like that scene, um, and I think if it was up to just them, they, they wouldn't have kind of shot it, so I think that was an example of, I had to kind of, I felt really uncomfortable too, but at the same time, I knew to capture that to capture that moment really re just re reveals a whole other side of the community, um, and and you know, and I think too, just um, just learning. I mean, trying to keep up, like trying to learn. I'm learning at the same time as I'm trying to document, so just trying to keep up. And sometimes even I was just so in involved in in the moment and so impressed and kind of taken about. Then I was like, oh yeah, like. Where the camera is, like you know, let me make sure that everything's um, taken care of. Hi, how are you? Um, so, I don't really know how to frame this. This is for any of you who want to answer. So, I'm I used to teach Asian American Studies up at Hunter, and for those of you, it's it's the public college system here. I was adjuncted there, um, and uh, I also have been in and around hip hop my whole life. I'm I'm a hood Asian from New York. Um, there's and so I just. You know, you talk about the struggles in the movement of marginalized people and people of color. Um, what are your thoughts around the Asian privilege frame that has been emerging, um, coming out of this like this this idea that there's a special kind of anti-blackness in Asian communities, um, which I've been actually finding really disturbing. And for people who for APIA communities that are actually not part of this like imagined model minority, um, it's really challenging because part of the idea is that hip hop is that we are appropriating hip hop, where hip hop is, has actually been the assimilation for many of us um, in opposition to white assimilation. So, just in the context of Asians and, and APIAs and Pacific Islanders in hip hop, like what, how does that fit with this Asian privilege frame for you? I mean, um, no, I think that's a really good question, right? For, for example, um, it was a conscious choice to really center the Hawaiian experience, right? Center, center Hawaii and also center Hawaiians, but also center a, Hawaii, a Hawaiian audience. Uh, so for example, right, when Prime says like, okay, let's go through the history, it really should go to the South Bronx, right? But we wanted to center it and just start, okay, but like, What's the history of hip hop in in Hawaii? So we did that. Um, so on one hand, we are in our attempt to center Hawaii. We also erased the the true roots, the you know the black Puerto Rican 
South Bronx culture of it. So I think, you know, I definitely think that's a valid critique, right? Uh, so you could see how, on one hand, trying to center and switch it could be seen also too as erasing, uh, you know, a, a, the fact that it's black music. Um, I, I mean, I, I like what you said. I had a really interesting conversation with uh, Jeff Chang uh, about this issue, um, and I, it might. I, I actually feel that it's it's a good thing. I, I like. I think Asian Americans probably when we were growing up, right? We weren't. We grew up in hip hop, right? And so it wasn't. There was no issue about. Uh, appropriation, um, but I think uh, I think just because of the Black Lives Matter movement, I just feel like this younger generation is a lot more critical, and I feel like I think that's a good thing. Um, whether or not the discussion uh, is it appropriation or not, I don't have an answer. But I think it's it's a good to me. I think it's a positive conversation to have. Um, but at the same time, I think. It's coming from a generation that might not necessarily didn't grow up with the culture like we did, right? And so it's to them, to a younger generation, it might seem as appropriation to where us, it was really all we had, right? I mean, because uh, similar to, to you know, Prime, um, me being Japanese American, you know, I never wanted to rep America, and then when I went to Japan, I didn't want to rep Japan. And so really culturally, I wanted to rep hip hop, or if anything, I wanted to rep LA, right? Uh, and which is kind of a very hip hop, Cali gang kind of mentality. Um, so, and that was just organic. Uh, and I think we didn't think about it. But at the same time, I feel it's good if, if someone younger is like, well, do you consider that appropriation? I mean, I, I, it's not, I would have to look to other communities and ask them, you know? Um, so I, I think it's, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a good conversation to have. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, I want to say I really like the story, and uh, it's very interesting, and you present a lot of storyline in the documentary. It's about the growth of the artist, and about how you culture, and about how you teach those children. And, um, and although you didn't show it, actually we can feel the relationship between these two artists. So my question is actually, um, I'm working in a macro documentary uh, project and we also interviewing artists and we have problem of we got a lot of great information and we got a lot of things to share and there's multiple storyline but we have problem of how to deal with that and how to organize the multiple storyline and to make it a fluent story. So I want to ask about how did you organize that and what we'll help you with that? Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, you know, I think doing a documentary, you know a little, you only know so much going into it, and then you discover so much as, as you start filming. Uh, so, you know, I think for all of my films, um, you know, the, the real key points to get to is, you know, one is, is your themes, right? What themes, and we kind of knew what themes we wanted to tackle off the bat, right? Whether it was, um, you know, this, this merging of, uh, you know, modern, <laughs> hip hop culture with ancient Hawaiian culture, or just this whole theme of this resurgence of language and culture. Um, and then two, you have, you know, next is your, um, is your story, right? Is your, you know, your journey of your, your characters, the evolution that they're gonna go through. And then third is, is your structure. And for us, the structure was pretty organically built in because of the mural, right? Like basically these outsiders come to town integrate with the town, work on this project, and at the end they finish. Very simple. So I think those are the, the, the three kind of major key elements that, that I always focus on. Uh, but for us, it was, it was really um, lots of long uh, four-hour phone calls with the four of us really talking about um, you know, what, we, what we needed to explain, what we didn't need to explain. Because um, there were so many, I mean, once we got in, especially once we started shooting, there are just so many levels that we could have gone off to, but uh, you know we really wanted to kind of keep it focused, and and so yeah, it was just basically it took uh, a year and a half of editing every day, eight hours full time to to make that happen. Uh, 
All right. Um, I just like wanted to ask you, we're learning about like the environment from the indigenous perspective right now. And after watching the film, like you could tell the people had like such a strong connection to their environment and uh, you got to film those intimate moments that they're having. Did you start to experience some of the same feelings like what, as a witness to uh, what they're going through? Do you start to feel like a connection to the environment around you? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and I'm coming from like, you know, LA, not appreciating anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you know, at least for me, right, coming from, too, coming from a, a community context, um, I think, at least growing up, it was always framed as environmentalism. Uh, and to me, that also was a very, like, a white environmentalist movement that I didn't necessarily identify with. And so, again, going back to, um, and I think, yeah, other people can speak on it way more than I can, uh, this indigenous worldview, uh, you know, I really understood Oh, I was learning that it's 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 much more of a familial connection, right, than than doing good or or you know saving the earth. It is, but at the same time, it's more or less you know protecting your grandmother, right, or and how in really seeing that as a familial level. And for me, you know, having relationships with my grandmothers and you know things like that, drawing that connection, you know, I, I understood it a little bit more. But Jen. yeah, well, I guess I'll just say a little bit more about like. The ways that we've seen it with some of the youth who go through these the schools and um, I'm thinking about one um, <clears throat> young woman who I interviewed after she had graduated and she grew up in the same kind of area in urban Honolulu that Prime grew up in um, and had a difficult childhood and she began to just talk about how learning um, over the course of her time with us at Halau Kumana that, you know, the winds and rains are her kupuna, they're her elders. These are, like Tad said, these are grandparents, these are, um, these are direct ancestors, and that brought her a level of comfort that she had never had before, that, you know, um, these were loving forces. You know how, how there's that moment in the film where Prime says, like, I wish somebody had been there to tell me, and the way that she kind of expressed <coughs> it, having grown up with this worldview taught to her is that they, even if she didn't have human parents or grandparents with her telling, she did have these loving forces around her, guiding her. And if she just listened, that, um, you know, they would give her the messages that she needed to hear. Hi, so I have three quick questions. Um, what was your shooting ratio? Uh, and could you tell us a little bit about the cinematographer and the composer? Because music plays a very strong role in this film, and it's sort of your philosophy about it, and who was the composer, and where you pulled from. Um, yeah, um, so you know, Justin Ah Chong was the cinematographer, and um, part of the, the partnership was supposed to be me mentoring some of the younger um, filmmakers at OEV TV. Uh, I mean, I learned way more from them than they learned from me, so it didn't really work out that way. Um, but, you know, for example, Justin, Justin was 24 when we started filming. Uh, and he worked, he worked on the Jake film, and he was just a, uh, a production assistant. So he went from PA to being, you know, director of photography. So we really threw him on the deep end, and he definitely, you know, he definitely really um, just got so many, so many great shots. Um, and then music-wise, uh, most of the f music was done by this uh, producer named uh, Sabzi. Uh, he's a um, uh, Persian-American uh, producer from Seattle. Uh, he's one half of the group Blue Scholars and another half of the group uh, Maiden Heights. And um, I'm, I just been, I'm just a fan of his music. And so most of the tracks were actually from, that he had already um, produced for his albums. And so we just used the inter inter instrumentals that I really liked. Uh, but then once we, well, I showed him the cut, he kind of tripped out because he said, like, did you know, like, so all the songs that I actually picked, just because I felt it synced with the scenes, um, he actually had wrote while he was in Hawaii. Uh, and so it was really, yeah, because he was kind of like, how did you know, you know, and I was like, <laughs> you know. Um, but that, I think that was a, per like, that was a conscious thing to, 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 to carry, I feel, you know, images, content-wise, was very much Hawaii, so instead of necessarily y using traditional Hawaiian music, we went more with on on a hip hop, you know, um, level to kind of to carry again that that clash, not clash or, or coming together of of modern and and traditional. We shot, 
we shot 12 terabytes of footage. Um, so I don't, I stopped counting hours after that. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was a whole lot. Um, and, and as an editor, that's, I think that's good and bad, because I was a director and I kept on telling them to shoot, we shot way more, but then as an editor I had to pay for it, because I was the one that had to log it all. So we're actually at time, um, but thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much to Ted and Noe. Uh,